Hi everyone, it's Kent McCrona here from Enterprise Lab and welcome to another edition of the Lego Disruptors show. Um, as I've been saying through quite a lot of these shows in January, we've got it off to a massive, massive start. I've had some great experts and some great business owners on giving all the knowledge bombs, wisdom. This week we've had the amazing Raghav Parkash that was on earlier and he's, he's just been sensational. Um, and that's no less for my guest today, Cool Mahay. I mean, I've only just recently connected with Cool, uh, but what can I say about this guy? 32 years in the police, and we're going to be hearing a little bit about that. Uh, author of a book called Smashing the Habit, and we really want to know about this. But I was fascinated with some of the um, some of the work that Cool's been doing recently, in reg and in particular one of the lives that he did this morning about um, ego. So I've actually actually sorted this show about smashing through and breaking through your ego and from leading from within. Um, I'm not going to do too much more introducing of who Cool is. I'm going to get him on directly to, to start telling us more about this. But Cool Mahay, welcome to the League of Disruptors show. How are you, my friend? I'm awesome. Thank you very much, Ken, and thank you very much for the invite. It's, it's an honour to be here, to be honest. Oh, it's sensational. It's great to have you on as well. I mean, it's just so exciting that um, when, when we can connect with so many different uh, people that are serving and leading and doing these kind of things. And yeah. the, whole, the whole purpose of this show is really to spotlight on your genius so others can step into theirs. And I know you've got some real genius points, so it's, it's, an, it's an absolute honour to have you on the show uh, too. So look, um, cool. Uh, let's start off with a little bit about yourself. Uh, I think for some of our uh, viewers, either watching this live or uh, pre-recorded, perhaps don't know who you are. It'd be really great to know uh, who you are, sort of a bit more about your background and how you got to where you are today. So uh, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Ken, to start off with. Uh, guys, I'm Cole Mahay, and uh, for 32 years, I know I don't look old enough, <laughs> actually I do. <laughs> for 32 years, I was in the UK police service, and uh, 20 years of that uh, was as a senior leader. I, I rose to uh, the uh, pretty much the top levels, where I was responsible for several departments, specialised departments, from all the secret squirrel kind of stuff to mm. the operational critical management uh, kind of stuff. I've been in charge of homicide investigations. I've been in the middle of riots. Uh, I've pretty much done everything you can think of in the police service. And I was honored and blessed to have served uh, the community in that role. But you know what? Um, your purpose changes as life goes on. As you grow, as you get more experience, as you get more wisdom in life, you start thinking at a di different level and a deeper level, perhaps. Yeah. And about four or five years ago, I, I, I just thought to myself, you know what, I've lost count of how many dead bodies I've seen. In fact, I've lost count of how many post-mortems I've been to. Is this what I'm? my destiny was all about? Is this what my purpose in life? Is this what I, what I was put on the earth for? Mm. And as much as it was, it, it was changing lives, it was giving back to the community, it was making people feel safe. It's a really, really important job that I had. And, uh, you know, I honor and respect it and I love it for where it's taken me. Yeah. I realized that I wasn't changing people from the inside out. Mm. I wasn't transforming the world. I was changing the world by responding, yeah. but I wasn't transforming the world by getting within and changing people from the inside out. Mm. Now, I've been coaching people to be honest, for about 20 years. Uh, seriously coaching people for the last five or six years. Mm. And uh, I've realized that one of my greatest feelings and greatest moments in life is when I see the light bulb switch on in somebody's eyes mm. and they get it. They understand how they can move forward in their lives. And consequently, it made me realize that that was my greatest skill. Yeah. People uh, is my greatest love. And, uh, and my skill is to get people to dig down deep within themselves, find that hidden potential that they've got locked away, that power source that we have somewhere around here, mm. and tap into that and lead absolutely extraordinary lives through peak performance. I mean, that's... And that's taken me on the journey to where I am now. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, obviously, your, your background is so transformational in that. The fact that, like you say, you were, you were sort of challenging the status quo and making... Uh, making environments safer with uh, your career in policing and stuff. Um, you, you, know, you, you talk about the fact that whilst you're creating safer environments, you, you have this kind of feel that, you know, it's not changing people's lives from within. Um, and when, when, when did that kind of, 
when did you start feeling that? Because I mean, you've got about, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, about 30 plus years in, in the police. And, 32 you know, years, yeah. You know, did you, is this, I mean, obviously you've, like you say, you've gone through all the different cases, you've seen so many different things. When, when was it in that career in your policing that you decided, well, you know, I, I, I am, I'm, I'm impacting people's lives from one perspective, but I'm not really quite satisfied that I'm really making a difference to people's lives. Mm. Well, I think there are certain moments in your life, and they do say that, you know, when you have significant events in your life, that that triggers a different kind of thinking. So there were certain moments in my life where I sort of went deeper and deeper and deeper into my thinking. Mm. Uh, back in 1990, for example, um, I was lying in hospital 50-50, um, having had uh, tuberculosis, half my left lung had been eaten away. That got me thinking about life in a much deeper perspective. You know, 13 years ago, I found spirituality and, uh, and I found God and, God and whatever God means to you, whether it's the universe, whether it's God, whether it's, uh, you know, whatever name you choose to use, the yeah. supreme power. And of course, that got me thinking in a much deeper context, you know. And I think really the, 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 the key point for me was about five years ago where I, I literally I was just sitting there one day uh, and just reflecting on life as you do. Yeah. You know, I'm a reflector and I was really internalizing and reflecting on life. And it was almost like a, this, this thunderbolt hit me, this thought hit me all of a sudden hmm. that I've had an amazing life. I've, I've had an incredible career. I've done so much. But what have I really given back? How have I really transformed the world around me? Because in essence, what you do as a police officer is you respond, you react to yeah. circumstances that have already been, that have already occurred, mm. you know? So what could I do to even prevent perhaps some of those circumstances from occurring and to create a different environment, a different world around me? What responsibility do I have to the world at large to do that? You know, and it was at that moment that I realized that policing wasn't enough. I wasn't in do doing enough in policing and I wasn't transforming the world. I wasn't changing people from the inside out. And that's perhaps what my real calling was. And it took me that long to realize. And, and when you started to realize this, and you know, I love the fact that your realization has come through reflection. I think, you know, it's not a judgment thing. You know, you haven't looked at your life and said, oh, I'm not fulfilling my potential and you know, I'm not happy. I mean, you've had, you've had a great career up to, you know, up to now and I'm, you know, long may that yeah. continue with what you're doing in this respect but from a mindset perspective you know you've you've you know from your inner self you've done this reflection you've got this realization it's a it's almost a, a point of self actualization that you've got to how are you feeling um when you're in that in that mode i mean um most people tend to become very excited you know that they've discovered something new about themselves but then equally they become very very anxious as well about what am I going to do to make that transition or how am I going to do that? Am Absolutely I going to be good not. enough? And um, what was going yeah. through with you, you know, at, at that moment in time, you've, you've been sitting there or however it is, you've, you know, that there's something at the back of your head saying, this isn't quite right. My heart's not, it's there, but it's not entirely there. And all of a sudden, kaboom, it's this thing, this realization hits you like a thunderbolt. Um, yeah. Wh what was happening with your emotions, your feelings and your thoughts? That's an awesome question, can I just say. Uh, and firstly, I do an awful lot of talks around purpose, finding your purpose. I mean, I just had my first signature event, Ignite Your Inner Potential, on Saturday in Coventry, which was, you know what, it was a greater success than I ever em envisaged it could be. The energy, the breakthroughs, the love that was coming through on that day was just incredible. Yeah. And I was talking there about finding your inner purpose. And, um, and we, we, it's... You know when you found your purpose because you have that sense that, and it is an inner sense of peace for me. It wasn't a, it wasn't this elate, elated moment in life. It was this deep, profound sense of peace within me that I found my niche. I found my corner. I found I found what it is that I was put on this earth for. Amazing. And the the thing is. If, if, we're if we're constantly thinking about, you know, I want to further myself, I want to, uh, you know, I want to increase my potential, I want to be more successful, that is your ego talking. And when we are ego-driven people, what we consequently and naturally do is we start comparing ourselves to others. So I would have had to then start comparing myself with all my colleagues in the, in the police service 
uh, not recognizing that every single person has their own path anyway, and therefore mm. our stories are all going to be different, mm. and our measurements in life are all going to be different. Uh, in, rather than looking outwardly, which is what I think the ego does, I reflected inwardly and I found peace. It was a deep, profound sense of peace that I knew where I was. I knew what I was all about. And all I needed to do now was to take some action. That's all I needed to do. Yeah. And the how will find its way. I love that. I love this bit that where you, where you talk about inner peace. Uh, um, last year when I was uh, doing my shows, I have um, a, a friend of mine, a colleague, Sean Whalen, who came on. He's the founder of Lions Not Sheep. And, you know, he's gone through so much controversy and all these different things. And I think that the part where he got to on realization was he just didn't want to be angry anymore. And for him, mm. it's all about truth. Um, you know, yeah. the whole the whole metaphor of speak the truth and the truth will set you free in this sense. And he, mm. I, I, you know, I take the same connotation of the fact that he's found it, it's not about elation, excitement, drive, motivation. It was peace, you know, for him to to for him to find the peace has made made allowed him to be so natural natural in what he does and i feel that's kind of the same connotation of what's going on with you in the fact that you've absolutely you've identified this piece and it, it it becomes it becomes more natural and when you are natural then it's the whole thing of you're more authentic in in, in your delivery absolutely. In this. so look you know uh, yeah, sorry yeah go ahead yeah and, and and I was just going to add to that by saying, you know, when you when you find your natural self, yeah, things around you happen. I, I constantly say that magic occurs in my life on a daily basis, and you can describe it as magic because it's inexplicable. What the things that happen are inexplicable. I don't know where they come from and I don't know how they come, but I think it's purely and simply because I that I have found myself. I have found what I stand for. Found who found out who I am. And it was interesting that uh, last night a friend of mine uh, put a post up on Facebook and said, you know, what makes you the happiest? Mm. And my, my response was so quick and it was so natural. And I said, peace. When everybody around me feels peace, when everybody around me is at, is at peace, I am at peace. And when I'm at peace, magic happens. It happens you yeah. know, uh, so we I think we run around in life constantly looking for elation. We look for significance. We look for things that uh, we are we could be recognized for. Even in business, people are always saying, and these these are the first words of advice that I was given: find your niche, find your tribe, find your crowd, uh, find out what you're good at. You know what? I've chosen to go with who I am and allow people to be uh, attracted towards me. I have clients from around the world now. I speak on many many platforms. And I haven't sought those out. They have come to me. And I'm a really big believer in you need to know yourself. You need to be authentic. Yeah. People throw this word around about being authentic, and yet it just comes down to four letters. Um, R-E-A-L. Be real. <laughs> be real to yourself. You, at the end of the day, when you go to bed with yourself, ask yourself the question, have I been truthful, honest, real with myself today? Or have I pretended to be something that I'm not? You know, and when we wear these masks, when we when we go onto the theater of life and try to be a character that we're not, yeah. it takes energy. And at some point in time, at some point in time, you will resort, resort back to the spots that you are wearing, wearing yeah. you know, and then you get found out. Mm. And I don't want to be found out anymore. No, that's 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 it's just so simple and but yet so yeah. effective what you're saying here and you know at the end of the day it's the, the simplicity of th that part of authenticity is about being real you know and, yeah. and and i suppose it's honest with yourself i think we often get consumed too much by the fact that we're now out there we're we're looking at personal development we're, we're helping others you know we've got a is there a small edge of I need to be better than the next guy you know i don't want to we'll get into sort of things like clients and, and uptakes and more importantly i want to also get your views on the personal development industry itself later on in in this sure. conversation but sort of coming back into this now you know you've 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 embarked in this journey of self-realization you you're you're in this pace of peace um what's what's happening to you from there i mean how did you get started you know you 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 yeah, 30, 32 years in the police. I, I, I heard you in your live, you were talking about the fact that you were even managing football matches in terms of the policing of football matches and stuff like that. You know, there's so much 
contrast in in the work that you're doing there you've got this you've That's got it. this desire <laughs> you've got this desire to to do this stuff um what what did you do to start making the transition from being someone who's um helping you know maintain and change environments to to making these trans transitions of people from well, firstly i adopted i adopted my natural taught skills as a senior leader i strategized i drew up a a mental strategy if you like and and this is how i operated for all those years you know everything had to have a strategy it had to have a goal it had to have a strategy i needed to know where i was going it needed to have milestones uh, and I needed to put some time scales around the milestones. And I still suggest that to people now. When they're looking for any element of transformation in their lives, mm -hmm. have the end goal in mind, have a strategy, understand what it is, and what, what are your milestones, what are your steps that you're going to take to get to where you want to get to. But I, I had this sort of senior, senior officer strategy in my mind, and I paved my path over the next four or five years that I was still left in the police service. So I went out, first thing is get your qualifications. You know, so many people operate in the personal development industry, I have found without qualifications. Mm. And I don't know why you would want to do that. Mm. You need your teacher, you need your own learning to be at the very highest level yeah. in order for you to give the highest quality. Mm. You know, so I went on uh, a coaching course. I found the right coaching company. I went on a coaching course, got my coaching co qualifications. I actually went off and got three coaching qualifications because I, <laughs> I wanted to be I wanted to be that comfortable about coaching and NLP. Uh, and then I went off and got uh, hypnotherapy. Uh, so my hypnotherapy qualification, purely and simply because I was fascinated by the subject of the, the subconscious mind. Yes. And and even for the speaking, I've been on a course for my speaking. I just think that if you're going to be as good as you can be, you need to learn the basic structures of the subject matter that you're going to deal with. Yes. And then your authenticity plays out and you make it your own. Hmm. So when I speak on stage now, uh, I prefer not to use audiovisuals and PowerPoints. I did on, on Saturday and I didn't keep to them, which I knew I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to discipline myself around that. I but I, I like to come from the heart center. I like to come from my, my gut instinct rather than my ego, my mind as aspect. And I think when we allow our ego to kick in, when we allow our mind to kick in, oh. we over over analyze and we over rationalize everything. Yes. yes. And it doesn't become real then for me. You know, for me, it needs to be authentic. I say absolutely create the foundation for what it is that you're doing. And the qualifications for me were the foundation. But then I had to be Kulmahay. I had to remain as Kulmahay yeah. and not as somebody else. And I think one of the greatest things that I've learned, um, having, bear in mind, I've never been involved in business in any area of my life until I started this. Yeah. It was a, such a massive learning curve. And do you know what, Ketan? I'm still climbing that mountain of steep, steep learn, uh, learning curve. Even now, I'm learning something new every day. It blows me away, you know, every single day. There's something to blow me away. Um, but one of the things, one of the key things that I have learned about business, about life, about success, mm. about anything, it doesn't matter whether you're in business or work or relationship, yeah. is stop looking at other people. Just stop it. It's Amen. the worst thing that you can do. Amen. Stop comparing yourself. You know, when you see somebody being successful, put your hand on your heart and say, you know what, blessings to that person. I hope that person goes on to succeed. Their story is not your story. Stop comparing. You'll never be the same as somebody else. You just can't do it. I can't put it, I can articulate it in some fancy language, yeah. but you know, quite basically, stop it. It doesn't help. I love that. I love that so much because I think, you know, we're, we're, we're naturally born into this competitive nature thing that, you know, I got to be either, you know, I, am I as good as this person or am I better than this person? And then, you know, there, you know, without us even controlling it, sometimes you get these inner thoughts of why does this person get better results than I do? One yeah. of the things I put in, I blame also things like social networks and social media as well, to a certain extent. You see, you think about the way in which we use our our social um, social media platforms and stuff. You tend to see that a lot of people will celebrate all their successes. They will show all of their winnings. Um, and that's only even a fragment of that tip of that iceberg. I think the, the, the true journey that people have gone through to actually achieve that success 
Now, what happens is people create, uh, you see, I'm a believer of perceptions, behaviors, and attitudes. You know, yeah, that's what I, I work on. That's what my, my company does. You know, I, I believe if I can change your perception, I can change your behavior, I change your attitude, you'll change your action, you'll equally change your result. And it's the same thing Absolutely. here. When someone sees something on a, on a platform and they see, ah, oh, look, immediately, rather than doing what you do, where you reflect it, they create a judgment. Oh, mm. he's on again, or oh, she's off again, basically, just killing my timeline. All I see is their success, success, success. And then it kind of starts to put this, this element of rivalry, your ego, again, this is your ego. This is what you say, it's your ego that's Absolutely playing, right. playing tricks with your mind. Right. So, so it's, yeah. it's, it's, I think, which is why it's so important that we have shows like this, basically, which allows us to unearth a little bit more about the truth behind yes. what's going on. You know, it's not like one day you decide to quit the force and next day you become an international speaker and you're an author and this. There's a lot of stuff that went in and a bit that you talk about consistently about investing in yourself. Um, recently, I, for my magazine, I interviewed a, a lady called Kathleen Black. She supports or uh, helps people build uh, teams that have become top 1% of their industry. And there are three points that she measured out to, to us, which I'm going to share with you. I want to get your viewpoints on this because this is very much around mm. the kind of thing that you're doing. You're, you're, you know, that leader within, you know, be, you know, living the life of freedom and happiness means that you've got to be at the top 1% of your game. Absolutely. Yeah. So the three things that she said is number one is mastery. Okay. She goes, what she, uh, what she, what she went on to say is that you need to master your niche. You know, at the end of the day, if uh, it should right. become so, so, um, uh, you become so masterful at it that, um, that it becomes part of your DNA. It just, you just do it yes. without even thinking. Okay. The second thing she said is less information, more wisdom. Okay. The world is full of populated with, with information. Anyone can get information, but it's wisdom that cr uh, cracks the boat basically in that respect. And, and, and the third thing that she's, um, she kind of went on to talk about uh, in, in regards to, to this is the invest in yourself. You've got to, you know, especially with what we do in the industry, we work with businesses, we work with individuals, we, we uh, our clients are pretty much, we're not towing them along, but to a certain extent is you've got to, you've got to be one or two or even three steps ahead of your client in terms of your your knowledge yeah. or understanding your ability so those three things yeah. mastery um wisdom and um and you know continual self-investment that's what she kind of ca capsulated in terms of how you become top one percent of your industry what do you say to something like that well, do you know what? As you're talking, I'm thinking it through and I'm applying it to myself. And without having the the wisdom that she had and the knowledge that she had, I'm quite pleased to think that I've done all of that. You know, in terms of mastering my niche, for example, I call myself the immersion coach. So what does that mean? My, so my immersion coaching is about where I'm, where I'm the happiest, where I get most pleasure, where I get most results is when I take a client and I immerse them in the coaching for an intense period of time, like maybe over a couple of days, maybe over three days, and I get the best results. And that client is living and breathing it. I make them work really, really, really hard on the issue that it is that they're trying to resolve. Mm. And I find that they get the best results and the more longer lasting results as a, as a consequence of that. Now, why do I do immersion co co coaching? What drove me to do uh, towards immersion coaching? Okay, so let me explain. As a police officer, as a senior police officer, I really need to be on top of my game. I made some critical life and death decisions. Mm -hmm. So I was trained in critical incident management. Mm -hmm. I was trained in firearms command. I was trained in public order command. I was trained in what they call a senior identification manager. That's where you have mass fatalities and you have to collect body parts and identify the victims. Mm -hmm. I was trained in uh, CBRN, which is chemical, biological, nu nuclear, radioactive. Mm -hmm. So any one of those critical scenarios scenarios could occur at any one time. I had my day job, but I was also on call for all of those specialisms mm -hmm. in murder, in murder investigations, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. For each one of those, I had to go through very intense training. Mm -hmm. And for me to be able to flick it on at two o'clock in the morning when I'm lying in bed and somebody rings me up and says, you know, we've got somebody running around with a, a gun there. Mm -hmm. I needed to make all the, uh, the, 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 the decisions around the deployment of the firearms officers and then what they did. 
and take the responsibility on lying in my bed at two o'clock in the morning. I needed to be at the top of my game. Yeah, yeah. And every single bit of training that I ever went, went on for yeah. those kind of scenarios, um, we were immersed into it. Okay, so we went, we started very early in the morning. We inevitably uh, were taught until very late at night. We had exams every single day. We had what we call the immersion suites. Okay, so let's assume that it's public order, for example. Yeah, so we would be, be sat in a suite like this. Yeah, We'd have uh, television, um, had televisions all around the walls. Mm -hmm. We'd have mock Sky TV uh, news coming in. We had telephones that were ringing and we had to pretend that we we're in a real life scenario. You soon forgot that you weren't in a real life scenario because it felt so real. Mm. Actors coming in, actors interviewing you, uh, people, uh, telexes coming in and faxes coming in and telephones ringing, all this kind of stuff. That was immersion. You literally cannot forget that experience. So it becomes part of your DNA. Mm. Okay, so so I know that I'm the master in my niche of immersive, uh, immersive coaching because I take my clients through a similar journey. I had a client, for example, who reached out to me, she hadn't been, she, she'd, she'd got a phobia about driving on a dual carriageway. She hadn't driven on a dual carriageway for 15 years. So I said to her, are you interested? Are you really up for the game? Are mm. you really prepared to take action? Are you really prepared to go through some intensity? She said, mm. yes. Over three days, we co I coached her, and over three days, she drove from 10 miles on a dual carriageway to 20 miles to 40 miles. She's now driving all over the country, and she has no issues. 15 years worth of phobia just released like that through intensity of coaching. So that's why I call myself the immersion coach. So I think mastery in your niche is so critically important. Mm. Uh, the second thing around wisdom, I think absolutely 100% right for me. If you look at most of my Facebook lives and the live broadcasts that I do on Instagram, it's all about wisdom. Mm. I think you can Google um, anything that you want and the information is there. We're living in a world full of knowledge, full of information, mm. but that information doesn't take us very far if we don't have that inner sense of why we're doing what we want to do. Yes. If we don't have a sense of, you know, I, I, wa I want to overcome my ego. Why? Why do you want to overcome your ego? What is the critical factor for you to overcome? Your do you understand why it is necessary to overcome your ego? And I think this is where wisdom is so very important. It helps you form that foundation of knowledge, of purpose, of understanding yourself at a deeper level. Yeah. Uh, and, and the thing is about self-investment. If I were to tell you that in the first year of my business, I invested something like £40,000 in my own learning. Uh, last year, I invested a similar amount in my learning. And I don't think that uh, you can be as good as you can be, no matter how good you are as an individual within you, mm -hmm. no matter how strong your purpose and strong your understanding and your strategy, until you invest in you, how can you possibly expect others who are going to be requiring your service to invest in themselves? Yes. It's as simple as that for me. So when I have a client and I'm talking to that client, I'm pitching to that client essentially about my services, yes. um, at least I know I've walked the talk. At least I know that when I'm saying to that client, it's so important to invest in yourself, at least I know that I've done that. So there is nothing that I ask people to do. And this was the same in my policing career. There was nothing that I asked my staff to do. There's nothing I asked my clients to do that I'm not prepared to do myself it's massive. as simple as that you've got to walk it all massive, you've got to walk it. Yeah, no, it, it it is it is so true and the, the reason i kind of uh, i spin on these uh the, the, this, this kind of area is that obviously um we're saturated the, the industry is saturated mm. with uh, you know in fact it's exploded over the last five or six years there's just been an abundance um you know i put a, i put a bit of uh, uh and attribute, you know, I attribute a lot of this kind of blast into this industry uh, due down to the economic recessions of 2008, 2009. Yeah. A lot of people lost their jobs. They kind of, kind of thought, right, okay, yeah. maybe this is the time I kind of move into self-employment. Consultancy was the the main thing back then. All of a sudden, you've got these people who are thinking, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to carry on in a career now because of my retirement, you know, retirement ages. I want to have a lifestyle business. And what do they do? They, they pick up and think, well, you know, I've had experience. I've got life experience. Maybe I can help others. They just think it's an easy platform to, to you know, to, to step up onto. Hey, if I can give someone some advice, I'm good at giving advice. I can become a coach. And um, 
you're right. There is there is a certain uh, element of education and investment that you need to be uh, uh, kind of accreditations and qualifications to a certain extent. But it's also then um, it's also about staying in your lane and your niche. You you just you just explained yeah. right now where your speciality is. You're all about immersion. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're you know it's about that intense uh, intensity and immersion to get people into that force of habit and cater to the book and we'll talk about that in a second about smashing yeah, those sure. habits but you know that word ego you know it just sounds a nasty word you know ego um so one of the things i, I wanted to kind of just go through right now is uh, as a as a specialist who uh, who focuses on helping people break their habits rather than make yeah. the habits which is interesting. Uh, that's, a, that's a great disruptive way of looking at it because most people think, right, let's get you into a habit of things. Actually, you're saying, no, I need to break your bad habits, basically. You know, the ego thing. Let's say when, when someone approaches you, you've made your assessment of you know who they are, you know where they want to go, you're kind of one step ahead, et cetera, in this environment. What, what does it take? For, you know, what do you what, what do, you do uh, or what advice do you give to those people who have to have that transition and shift in their ego? Okay, so um, if we're talking about the ego, mm. first first thing I have to say about the ego, you know, we automatically think of this three-letter word and we think it's bad. Mm. We automatically do that. It's it's the way that we've been hypnotized. It's the way that we've we've, we've been conditioned, whether it's through spirituality or whether it's just a dirty word now. <laughs> the fact of the matter is this. There's two issues here. Firstly, your ego is not bad. Your ego is absolutely critically necessary for basic human survival. Mm. It gives you a sense of identity. It gives you a sense of who you are. And it gives you a sense of how to become your best. You know, mm. and I'm, I'm saying compare yourself to yourself. So your ego is important. But your ego is a bit like, um, it's a bit like a young child. Or it's a bit like that naughty puppy. Now, you could have this little puppy. You could have this child. And if you treated it with love, if you guided it in the right way, if you taught it certain things, mm. this puppy could become very obedient and very loving and very loyal, you know, uh, and not disruptive. Mm. Or it, or that child or puppy could, could become spoiled and be, become very, very unruly. Yeah. There's a great program just on, on the animal part about the dog whisperer, you know, and uh, this guy who comes into your house when your dog starts barking or ripping things up. And what he very cleverly, what he always does is he coaches the owners of the dog rather than the dog himself or yeah. itself, you know. So the ego is as good or as bad as you wanted to make it. But actually, at the end of the day, the ego is part of you and it's your mind. I, I call the ego the mind because the mind is a slave to the physical world in which we exist. It is conditioned, it is influenced, it is driven, it is uh, conditioned by all the external factors that we have in the world. Now you just look at the external world in which we live, this physical world in which we live. We want everything right away. We compare ourselves to each other. We, we, you know, if you look at programs like The Apprentice, they are very competitive environments. And most of our programs now on a Saturday night is all about competition, mm. come dancing, you know, um, um, Apprentice, um, X, X Factor, Factor. Yep. Britain's Got, all of these programs are all about competition. It's all about competing with somebody else. Mm. It is no wonder, therefore, that when we are going through life, we want to be dressed better than somebody. We want to have the better haircut. We want to do better business. We want the better relationship than somebody else. And it's our ego that's a slave to this physical world in which we exist that is doing all of that. Now, for me, mm -hmm. I think the other part of you is the, the inner guide, the spirit, the soul, whatever you want to call it. And this is attached to a different realm. It's attached to the universe, the energy that's around us. And it's a deeper sense of you. It's that sense of you that, that the sense is peace. You know, it is that sense, it is that part of your, your makeup, your DNA that senses these kind of things that yeah. your ego simply could not. So I think with the ego, um, it is about habits. It literally is about habits. You know, with the ego, if you have got the habit of judging other people, if you've got the habit of uh, questioning yourself, of being fearful, of being nervous, of doubting yourself, that's your ego talking. Mm. Because it's, it's comparing itself to the outside world. Yeah. Whereas the inner guide, you know, we all have that sense where, the, you know, deep down, 
this, this is the right thing. You know deep down that you could be successful. You know deep down that you're good enough. You know deep down. That's a different voice. We just need to separate the two voices and recognize the two voices for what they are. And with the ego, we, need to break, we don't need to break the ego. We just need to break the habit of what the ego is doing on a daily basis. Yeah. So I have a daily battle with my ego. I have a constant daily battle. I will never get to a point in time I know. I will never get to a point in time when I, when I, have, uh, uh, when I don't have an ego or I'm not egotistic. We all will be. And anybody who tells you that they are not egotistic is more than likely egotistic. Yeah. Denial more is the word there. Yeah, absolutely. It's I a mean, bit like somebody who says to you, Ketan, you know, I, I am humble. Well, if you were humble, you wouldn't have to tell me that you're humble. Yes. You know? Yes. It's yes. a bit like that. Yes, yes, like yes, that. yes. No, no, I... I, I... It is. It's almost the, the affirmation that you're telling yourself that you're humble. You know, it's almost Absolutely, like you've got yeah. to confirm it to yourself. Oh, I'm humble. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if I say I'm humble, then I feel that I'm humble. Uh, yeah. It's it, you, it, There was a little bit you're talking about in terms of the reference or the points of um, your ego writes checks that your body can't cash to a certain extent. Um, and I suppose mm -hmm. you get to that point that no matter who you are, um, there's always going to be a slither slice or or percentage of ego within you because the ego as much as there's absolutely. negativity within it there's also positivity in the in, absolutely in, in, yeah because because part of your drive comes from your ego in this respect yeah but you know the words like success and failure and fear and all of these things have their own connotation or effect within your ego in this perspective so you take the example of that lady you you mentioned as a part of your case where you know she's um you know how you've kind of got her into the practice of driving and now she's been able to you know move from just driving 10 meters to ride, uh, driving on motorways what is it that intrinsically that people need to do um to uh, to balance positive ego and negative ego i think uh, one, one of the key things and i mentioned this on my facebook live this morning um just running through some, some of the points, I think first you need to recognize your ego. You need to acknowledge that you have an ego. Yeah. And it's a bit like a habit. I, you know, I, I smashed so many habits. Um, 13, 14 years ago, um, I was a big beer drinker. I was drinking four pints of beer a night. I was a whiskey connoisseur. I was dr eating meat and fish and eggs. I was, um, I was smoking. I'd been smoking since the age of 16. Mm. I stopped everything overnight because I acknowledged the habit it's the first step of anything. You need to acknowledge that you have an ego in the first instance, because otherwise you, you're not going to be desirous of actually doing anything about it unless you acknowledge it. You need to be able to talk to your ego, develop a relationship with it. There's a great book, and I forget the person who wrote it, uh, but it's called The Chimp Paradox. It's one of my favorite yeah. books. Yeah. Uh, and it, in a very simple kind of way, it describes what's going on inside our minds. You know, now. If you were to go on a course on hypnotherapy, you'd talk about the subconscious and the conscious part of your mind. He gives it a different name. He gives it the chimpanzee part of your mind, which is a very emotionally driven part of your mind, response to everything with emotion. And then he has the human part of your mind, which is your logical part of your mind, your conscious part of your mind. Mm. And he says that if you allow the chimpanzee to become unruly, then your life will become unruly because you'll constantly be responding in a very emotional kind of way yes so if you're going to train your ego if you're going to train the chimpanzee to calm down and be much more well behaved you need to talk to it so mm -hmm. learn to talk to your ego i talk to myself all the time <laughs> i'm a natural reflector i'm a natural introvert i challenge myself i talk to myself i laugh at myself all the time and i think that's so very important uh, recognize what the ego sounds like you know i've already mentioned that there are two voices inside your head yeah. there's the ego part which is very um, very fearful on occasions, very judgmental on other occasions, mm. and looks outwardly at other people, looks inwardly at you and tells you you're not good enough. You know, all these limiting beliefs that you form about yourself, that's all ego based. Mm. And then there's another part of you that it's a secret hidden away part of you. And you feel it, it sort of reverberates around your body that says you are good enough. You know, that yeah. venture that you're about to take, you were meant to take that path, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's your inner guide, and that's your ego. So it's just recognizing the difference between the two. Uh, and then I, I, I always say this. This is something I practice on a day-to-day. -day. I'm so alive to my ego, yeah. and, and I use the analogy from my policing days. 
that uh, if I, I am always looking for an opportunity to catch my ego red-handed. <laughs> I'm looking for that opportunity all the time. When like ego kicks in and it's doing something that it's not supposed to be doing, I, I catch it red-handed as if it was a criminal. I put the handcuffs on to say stop it, it say and it. then I talk to it, I talk to it, That's... and I reframe what it's saying. Say it, say it, you arrest it. <laughs> Arrested! Arrest your ego, guys! Arrest your ego! Get your handcuffs out and slap those handcuffs on the ego and then talk to it. Tell it it's saying the wrong thing and reframe what it's saying and your whole life will change. Seriously, your whole life will change. I'm telling and finally... You to, 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 sorry, sorry, just to cut in there. Today, it was, it's been the quote of the day. I, I switched on the live. I was all, all, uh, watching court speaking and addressing and you know you talked about the chimp paradox and stuff like this and then all of a sudden you just yeah. said arrest your ego and i'm like oh my god what a <laughs> what a line arrest your ego it's it it's Absolutely. just it's just sensational but yeah please i know you're on your flow um you know what's the final part you've 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 talk, final you've part. talked i mean it's very ego. very simple learn to laugh at yourself learn yeah. to laugh at yourself because when you're laughing at yourself you're actually laughing at your ego yeah. And when you're laughing at something, it doesn't seem so serious anymore, you know? Yeah. Uh, and life can be so serious. We make life so blooming serious. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, and the more serious you make any aspect of your life or any occurrence on your daily, in your daily routine, yes. the more serious you make it, the more importance you give it. The yes. more importance you give it, the more it dwells in your mind. Mm -hmm. The more it dwells in your mind, the more your ego is stoked and your ego is going to kick you. Uh, uh, constantly about it. So let's make a distinction here, Cole. This isn't a root. This isn't about happiness. This is this is actually about um, unleashing this um, this uh, the the seriousness or the authority or the focus that you that, that your ego allows. You know, mm. this leads to you creating inner peace with yourself, which then forward Absolutely. leads uh, leads to to a path of happiness so you know we're most happy uh, i mean we've had people in the past saying that you're most happy when you are you you find your inner child again and you know that's when your yeah. basic needs are, are are met and you know you're kind of happy but what you it, it is interesting that you mentioned that you know when we're under pressure it seems as though everything around us is crumbling yet when we when we get past those phases you know we seem almost invincible and, and do you think unconsciously people do actually laugh at their egos, but they don't realize that they're doing it? Yes, I think people do and people don't recognize what they're doing. So people say, I laugh at myself or people have, will have a giggle at something that they've done wrong, but they don't recognize why they're doing it. And I think if you, if you understand what you're actually doing, it gives you even more power. Now, when I talk about the ego, the ego is so, I'll, I'll explain why the ego is so big for me. Yeah. It actually links into my own, own spiritual beliefs. I think there's five aspects, uh, and we could do a whole spiritual discourse on this, but there are, I think there are five aspects that actually drag you down into the noise of the world. And those are lust, anger, greed, ego, and attachment. Lust, anger, okay. greed, and attachment. Lust, lust anger, greed, ego, and attachment. Okay. I think these are the five powers that pull you down into this physical world, into the noise of the world, rather, should I say. So when we talk about lust, we're not just talking about the physical act of lust. Lusting after something. When you have that, you know, that inexplicable desire to achieve something that is, um, that is, that makes you feel good temporarily, you're lusting after something. Yeah. When you are greedy, it means that you are wanting more than you actually need you know uh, when you fill your plate up um, and any good nutritionist will tell you you only put on your plate what you need to eat and you leave on your plate what you don't need to eat so how often is it that uh, question yourself how often do I leave stuff on my plate yes. when I've finished eating how much stuff is left and therefore ha therefore how much waste is there yes. you know so that's your uh, that's your greed and greed can apply to money can apply to possessions no anything. anything else when it comes to um, when it comes to lust, anger, ego, greed, ego, ego, and attachment. Yeah. When it comes to attachment, attachment is when you define yourself through your status, through the, your possessions, what car you drive, what house you live in, what clothes you wear, what status you have in in life. You know, when I was a senior police officer, I would walk into a room and people would stand up. Well, I would walk around headquarters or any other police station, and people would call me boss and sir. 
And I recognize that uh, I could be playing up to this with my ego. I know other senior officers, some other senior officers did, yeah. but I didn't. I didn't want people to respect me for what was on my shoulders. I wanted people to respect me for who I am as a leader. Uh, and I very often found myself saying, you don't need to call me boss. You don't need to call me sir. You call me cull. The important thing is that you do what I ask you to do because you understand why you need to do it. That's much more important. Yes. And so lust, anger, greed, ego, and attachment. Those are the five powers that I think pull you downwards. When you manage to control all of those, not only can you find your inner self, but you also learn to see life in a very abstract kind of way. You must rise above the noise on social media, on, outs, uh, you know, on the streets outside, amongst your relatives, those people who cause drama in your life. You rise above all of that and you see life in a much more peaceful kind of way. That's yeah. when I find my ultimate peace. And do you feel that when you're uh, with ultimate peace, uh, it's, it re-navigates the way in which you behave and act? and actually the results of your actions are a lot more fluid or congruent with your expectations. Because I think um, often enough when we do things in fear and anger or resentment uh, or with greed or the attachment or lust, it has these kind of connotations that we have an expectation here and the outcome comes really here. And what I say is if, if your expectations here and your your delivery is here, that gap in between the two things is what we call failure. I call that failure. Yeah. So it, so the, the very notion of the fact that, you know, you, when you start to manage these traits within, you know, the, the, as you mentioned, lust, anger, um, greed, ego, and attachment, mm -hmm. yeah, and you start to even unconsciously find inner peace, naturally your actions are becoming a lot more congruent. With, Absolutely, with I, th I think you make better quality de decisions you have a, 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 a better compass in your life in terms of really understanding where it is that you're going to. Yeah. You have a greater chance of finding the true purpose in your life. Mm -hmm. I did a Facebook Live on this only a couple of days ago. Uh, I asked the question, where are you when you make a decision? And my question was really about where are you in terms of your your psychology, where are you in terms of your mood, where are you in terms of your feeling when you make a decision. Mm. So many of us go through lives and we make decisions as a quick response to a feeling that we've got, we've, we've had. So something might occur us, uh, around us that causes us to be angry, upset, distressed, stressed out, worried, whatever it might be. And then our natural desire is to make a decision based on that. Mm. But when we are making a decision at that low point of mood, how good a quality of decision is it going to be? Now, let me just explain this in a different kind of way. When a firearms officer, and this, this, this was scientifically proved with firearms officers around the world. So a firearms officer in this country, we don't, we don't routinely arm our police officers. So we have specialized firearms officers, mm -hmm. highly, highly trained individuals. And it was there was some scientific testing on that when they're pointing a rifle at somebody and they shoot somebody, when they're interviewed later on said, so what was going on around you? They don't know. There was, they were in a high stressed environment and they had focal vision. All they saw was the person or the circumstances or the situation directly in front of them. They had lost all their spatial awareness. It is no different when we are highly stressed when we are highly, uh, when we are in a negative mindset, negative mind state, when we are coming from a bad place in terms of our feeling, our mood, and then we make a decision, it means that we are just being focal in our vision. We're only focusing on that one issue, mm -hmm. and what we're not seeing is a spatial aware, ha having is a spatial awareness. And if we were to, we might find a whole raft of information that could have assisted us to make a better quality decision and I think when you are in a sense of peace you have this spatial awareness all the time my radar is going all the time across the board and I'm looking for new inspiration all the time if I'm coming up against a challenge and let me let me be honest I have challenges every single day of my life yeah. I've had some of the biggest challenges that you can think of in life you know divorce uh, death destruction uh, near death for myself I've had it all so there is not much that I haven't experienced in life yeah. but what I have learned is to take a step back and when I take a step back I can see the bigger picture when I used to command in public disorders and I've been in the middle of riots I learned to 
because I had to make the decisions in terms of where my officers were going to go. I learned to take a step back, mentally review the situation and not respond mm -hmm. and simply see what, what was going on around me so I could make better informed decisions. And I think we can employ that to our lives anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, again, part of the work that you do is, you know, apart, you know about breaking, those, breaking through those habits and looking at managing those uh, egos and, and, and the traits around those egos is obviously focusing more on the leadership side of things. And I suppose this is one of the biggest catalysts that you have within this is, you know, um, leaders often, you know, CEOs of companies, big, big senior directors of big corporates, they, yeah. they never say that they're stressed. They, uh, they fear, they always say that we're stressed. You know, they can't say the word mm. fear because, you know, they've got so many people underneath them that are, are looking up to them in terms of a guidance and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I suppose this is one of the biggest catalysts for them that when, whatever your circumstance, whatever your situation, your, the, your spatial awareness to it is very, very limited because of the way that you're looking at it. Um, so Absolutely. just that simple, simple one step back to be able to see a more broader horizon could, uh, the way I suppose you could describe it is that it gives you more options. I look Absolutely. At it, I look at it as a change in uh, dynamics. I, I, I talk about one, you know, I, talk, I told you about the 1% change equals 100% uh, change in your results, 1% change in the way you look things. Absolutely. But if you, Absolutely, if, you, yeah. if, you, if, you if you were to angle your development by 1% rather than looking at it like this, just by 1%, mm. it, it kind of crosses over and, 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 you know, where it takes you is to a completely yeah. different endpoint. Completely different destination. Yeah, absolutely right. And you know what? Um, when we talk about CEOs, I work with a lot of CEOs and senior leaders, and that, I guess is that's where I, 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 I naturally gravitate to because I've been there. And it's very easy for CEOs to dismiss how they're feeling. And actually what's, being hap what's happening deep down inside is the fire is being stoked. Mm -hmm. And so we use all sorts of soft language. We say, I'm stressed, or I've got a lot on, or, you know, there are some challenges at work. We use a lot of soft language to describe something that actually can be very, very hard. It's like a volcano that's about to erupt. And I want to help CEOs and senior leaders understand this concept of spirituality and leadership. So, you know, it's a, it's a program that I'm putting together around spirituality and leadership because I think the two go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. It helps us to learn how to take that step back. And I think, you know, in, an analogy that I very often use is this. You know, you imagine a, a football field, a soccer field for people who might be viewing from outside of UK, a soccer field. And, a, a, and one of the players is running full pelt down the, down, down the pitch and dribbling that ball. Now, we know that he needs to get to the other end to score a goal. But if he only focused on that ball, he would only see that ball. Mm -hmm. What you'll see good soccer players do is they will pause momentarily and they will put a foot on the ball and look around them. Which other team players could he pass the ball to? Or where exactly is the goal in relation to where he is now? What angle could he kick that ball? He, uh, so much goes through his mind in that split second. So why I, what I want to do with people, and it's not just CEOs, anyone who uh, trains with me, I want them to learn how to put that foot on the ball so that they can see the greater picture and they can make better informed decisions because they've got more information. Man, man, man. I told you, Cool Mahays is just going to drop bombs, <laughs> knowledge bombs, serious, it's serious, great, serious, serious, <laughs> serious knowledge bombs. I'm telling you, we've only got about five minutes. Here's the thing, Ken, you, know really, you know what I really love yeah. is the fact that you're challenging what goes around on social media. There is so much going on on social media in terms of the whole personal development industry. Yeah. And I think it's great that you challenge that because we've overcomplicated it. We really have. We use language that is too complicated. We use uh, processes, systems, and everything else that is overcomplicated. And it's so unfair to the people out there who could really be benefiting from personal development because we all need it. Yeah, no, and I, I appreciate that. And it's one of the things I think it's just, I mean, look, I've got I've got Jason Cannell coming up next week on on, on the show. He he's the infamous uh, writer of that article, that personal development, Tony Robbins, and he'll have to answer to that on his show. But there yeah, are some I points look forward in there. to that one. And it's it's very much this whole thing of um, the very nature of if we keep talking about the negative connotations, we're only putting spotlights onto that. Uh, you know, that came up on what yeah. Raghav and I were talking about the other day uh, on on his yeah. show. Um, whereas actually 
it's 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 the challenging by doing in this respect. So I mean, yeah. for for me here, it's it's really important that just through just through a contrast conversation with you, we can we can pick up so many so many important bits. It's not about the whole picture. Sometimes it's just about one trigger that gets in uh, that yeah. that starts from this. So 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 the very the, the the very sort of point of of doing things like this is so others can create that realization and and you know to have someone yeah. like you of your caliber with your experience coming in and really talking about it from such a simplistic non egotistical non arrogant way uh, or you know this is the way it should be it's more of a situation of this is why you're not getting what you're what you want because of this. Yeah. Really. It's it's game changing. It's game changing in that way. And do you know what? I could do this. I could carry on talking to you for hours about this kind of stuff. <laughs> Likewise. But you won't believe it. I have. I have. We have only three minutes left on the clock. Can you believe really? we've been talking <laughs> for an hour? We've had. You know, time flies when you're in love with what you're doing. You know? Absolutely. Exactly. And uh, I think they do. It, it absolutely flies really, really quickly. But I. I you know, and I, I think I'm going to really kind of look forward to getting you back on the show again at some point in the future about one or two sort of key uh, key oh. points. But I know as the broadcast, you know, um, um, and, and from the pre-recorded, there are going to be people that will resonate with what you're doing. There uh, there will be people that will be like, how do I get in, um, get involved? Um, or they'll be looking for breakthroughs or, or bits of advice. So, you know, to the world out there, you know, um, how can they connect with you? Um, how can they get access to uh, to any of the programs or courses that you have, and as 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 I mentioned before, you also have a book. So, could you give us some details on on, on how we can connect uh, and, and and work with you? Sure, absolutely. Like well, the first thing, the book is called Smash the Habit. It's available in Amazon, in Kindle, print, or even if you want to listen to my dulcet tones, it's available in uh, audiobook as well. Um, good luck with that. Um, but if you want to connect with me and find out what I'm up to, my website is www.kulmahay.com. Nice and simple. Mm -hmm. uh, please do connect on there. Um, I have my, mem my, my website is also a membership site. This is part of my mission to change the world through the transformation of people. And I want it accessible to as many people as possible. On my membership site, I have got uh, all of my courses. I load up a course every single month all around wisdom. Uh, I have all my book reviews on there. I have all my hypnosis downloads on there. Wow. And it's only $27.99 a month. So I wanted to ma make it accessible across the world. There is no excuse for investing in yourself. And this makes it an even le less excuse because it's so cheap. I just don't want people using that excuse because it's an excuse that we embed in our mindset. And we put it off, we procrastinate, and then we wonder why our lives are still going on a downward spiral. No, that, that, that's so immense. Take action, people. No, that's absolutely immense. So look, guys, you know, we've come to the end of, uh, of, of this show, but look at this, immersion, intensity, we've talked about egos, you know, that we've, we've, we've you know, built into this whole thing about spatial awareness and how that uh, affects the quality of your decision making. At the end of the day, in, whilst, whilst one can always say pursue your dreams, uh, do this with integrity and do this with the reality of whatever you're pursuing, it's not you that's pursuing it, it's your ego that's pursuing it. And the minute you realize this, the minute you'll start to open yourself up to inner peace, which will naturally change the way in which you behave, act and achieve the results that you want. And that, my friends, is Cool Mahay. Cool. On behalf of the League of, League of Disruptors, I salute you and thank you very much for the time thank you uh, for so coming much. on and dropping all those bombs for us. And that's it. It's been that's a huge pleasure. Thank you. No, you're very, very welcome. And that's it. That's a wrap for this week. Uh, I hope you guys have had a disruptive one. Next week, we have got a hellfire of a week with uh, a number of different people. Jeff Nemeth. I've got JP de Villiers coming on. I've got Lena Kay talking about the art of transformation as well. Follow, you know, following all of that up at the end of the week with content creation management with the lovely Georgina El Moshordi. We've got so we've got a power pack week to, to run up to the end of January, so make sure you're tuning in. But for now, my name's Kat McCrona. This is the League of Disruptors show, and I'll see you guys very, very soon. <laughs>